We're finishing up our Love Dates and Heartbreak series, but simultaneously launching our new summer series called Come Together. Come Together right now. Uh, Anyway, uh, so today I get to share some more exciting news about what's coming up this summer. We're excited about this. But first, if you haven't been with us over the last five weeks, or if this is your first visit to Cross Point Church, uh, or your first time to tune in online. Our current series has been for high school and, and college students, graduate students, and singles who are dating. Uh, if you were married, but now you find yourself single again, and in this world where you're dating again and trying to figure and navigate all that and figure it out, uh, I hope you've been paying attention and not been taking this lightly because we've talked about a lot of stuff that can help you moving forward. Amen? A lot of stuff. Uh, If you're in a committed relationship or you're married, this series has been for you because we've discovered all kinds of cool things uh, about how to make existing relationships even better. Last Sunday, I thought Josh did a phenomenal job talking about dating. Was you here for that? Man, if you missed it, you should go back and watch that. Uh, I'm supposed to follow up and do part two on dating, but seriously, how do I add anything to that? Uh, How do you follow up that? Uh, I, I can't do it, so... Uh, Josh did so good. I'm going to pivot with the last sermon of this series and tie it into the first sermon of the next series. And before I get into that, let me just kind of set the groundwork, and I hope that you'll lean in and follow along. Have you noticed that it's really hard to challenge abnormal in our culture today? Man, if you do, you're going you're to get beat up in our society. Uh, I grew up with an idea of what normal was, But these days, normal is abnormal to me because of the way I was raised. Abnormal is hard to see if you don't have a guideline for what normal is supposed to be. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about to get us all on the same page. Some years ago, I was on a bumpy, turbulent flight going into Miami. I was invited to preach at a regional conference down there, and it was a big deal for me back in those days. And and I happened to be on this flight setting to a first-time flyer. She was a middle-aged lady, a little edgy, uh, every sentence, she had something that I couldn't repeat in this sermon. But she was a little nervous that day, so she felt justified in just saying whatever come out of her mouth. Uh, so anyway, she was really nervous. And I have to admit, things was going to get really um, heated in this, on this flight, a really shaky flight, the kind where briefcases fly, overhead compartments fall open, and, and toupees you know, lift up off your head. And dentures come out the whole nine yards. It was going to be a challenging, challenging flight. And so as we get into that kind of stuff, um, I told, I looked at this lady, and she's a nervous wreck. And I, I kind of look at her, and I said, ma'am, look, um, it, it's okay. It's okay. Planes are built to withstand this kind, of, this kind of an experience. And she looked at me and said, are you sure? I said, absolutely. Don't worry about it. You know, I've been through these kind of flights before. It's fine. Until a few minutes later, when stuff started happening that I had never experienced on a plane before. We hit air pockets. It would take, you know, these 50-foot immediate drops, and people's heads are hitting the ceiling. And, and I'm all of a sudden, I'm with her. I, I'm with her. She's cussing and carrying on. I was carrying on, and with a little bit of cussing, not a lot. But, um, <laughs> but honestly, when I get nervous like that, uh, I tend to pray out loud. I don't care who's listening. I tend to pray out loud when I'm really pressed and stressed. And so somehow, (laughs) reflecting, I I shouldn't have prayed this out loud, but I wasn't even thinking about it. But I said something like this, Dear God, please don't let this plane crash. Please don't let this plane crash. I don't want to die today. And for some reason, that freaked her out. But... Good news is we finally landed and, you know, spontaneous applause broke out. And when we came to a stop, this middle-aged lady, she didn't even wait for me. She crawled over me. She crawled, literally, true story, she crawled over me, didn't care. Cleavage, the whole thing, right there. Nothing I could do about it. Uh, you know, just right, just crawled, straddled me to get out. She wouldn't, she didn't care uh, and was a nervous wreck. And, I, and, you know, I thought I needed to send her off on a high note. I, and so I wanted to speak into her life something that I thought would help her. I said, look, you've got to understand, this was not a normal flight. This was not a normal flight. Usually it's really smooth. You can, you can drink a Coke, read a magazine, watch a movie, all that stuff. So don't, don't make your future pl- uh, travel plans thinking that this was normal. 
This was not normal. She looked at me like I'd lost my mind, and she basically said, when I get off this plane, I'm never getting on another one. It'll be buses and trains from now to Jesus comes. So that's kind of how it was. So in this crazy mixed-up world, how do we measure what normal is? How do we measure? She, she had no idea that that wasn't normal on a plane, and she probably has not flown again to this day. How do we make adjustments when we figure out that something is abnormal? Now, you guys have heard me talk about how my dad, my brother, and I used to restore old cars and trucks together. Uh, Now, those old cars, they had um, gauges built into the dash that were a lot easier to read than the computer stuff today. You know, you had to push a button to navigate to certain readouts, and those were real simple and, and easy to figure out. Uh, temperature gauges, oil pressure gauges, all that stuff. Anyway, my dad, my brother, and I, we built three 1956 Ford F-100 pickup trucks together, and, and I got to drive the last one that we built together to high school uh, my junior year. And just like the, the one I own now, except that one was uh, a dark red color. And, but before I started driving, I'll never forget it, uh, my dad gave me a lesson on the gauges. He carried me out and said, let me tell you about these gauges. You, got, you always need to monitor these. This is an old truck, and things can happen. And he let me know what normal readings were. He let me know what normal readings were, and he taught me to keep an eye on those gauges and make sure that they stayed in normal operating ranges. So I thought it would be interesting, a a good sermon, and I'm going to tell you up front, this sermon's a little edgy as I progress through it because 100% of the content is what I wrote. And when when I don't get resources from other guys that are a lot smoother around the edges, my stuff comes off a little edgy. So it's going to come off a little edgy, and I'm trying to smooth out what happened in the first service. That was not a train wreck or a plane crash, but I made some people nervous in the first service. I'm going to try to avoid that um, in this service. But I thought it would be interesting to try to define what a normal family might look like when we factor in the biblical narrative. And the Bible has a lot to say about family. I mean, if we could somehow put a gauge on your family dynamic. Would it give us a high-pressure reading, a low-pressure reading, or a normal-pressure reading? What does a normal, healthy family really look like based on biblical principles? A um, little background. I worked, and you've heard this before, but I'm repeating for a reason. I worked for an engineering firm in Fort Myers, Florida, and later for an architect in Bradenton, Florida. And I've drafted more sets of house plans than I could count back in the day. And I can tell you uh, something that used to be normal when people would build a home. Everyone that came to me, and I've still got a lot of these house plans uh, in the attic or somewhere in a big uh, folder, you know, that I look at every now and then. But uh, they would come to me 40 years ago for a set of house plans. Just about everyone wanted a front porch. You know, kind of like Cracker Barrel, they got the rockers out on the front porch and they've got the checkerboards and everybody gathers out there. And if you don't ever gather as a family, I've seen you at Cracker Barrel on the front porch. Well, back in the day, 40 years ago, that was common. It was very common that families gathered on the front porch. It was kind of a hangout. They'd wave at neighbors coming home from work and all that went with that. Uh, They wanted a defined space where they could sit with their family, enjoy their friends and, and neighbors, Uh, enjoy some downtime. Family and community was vitally important 40 years ago, and it was reflected in how people actually uh, budgeted to build their homes. It was a big part of that. Well, I did a little research to find out what is more common in modern-day houses and house plans today, because I haven't drawn house plans in many years. These days, the majority of homes include computer rooms or home offices, okay? Okay. Uh, I've been working with families for over 36 years as a pastor, and i got to tell you, front porch families, it's just my opinion, you can take it or leave it, but front porch families are healthier than home office families. Okay? Just think about that as we, as we go through this. Front porches used to be the norm. Now home offices, computer rooms are the norm, and most families today are not as healthy as they were 40 years ago. So... Today, let's come up with a house plan where front porches are a top priority. Symbolically, you're you're with me, you're tracking, right? Uh, In other words, let's define what a healthy family looks like. Front porch families make a healthy home. What does that kind of home look like? What does the Bible have to say about having a healthy, normal family in a culture like what you and I are part of today? Now, let me just tell you right up front, I'm not trying to upset nobody. There's a couple of points in here that's going to be painful for you to listen to. Okay, I promise you I'm not trying to to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. This is the last sermon in this series, and there's some things that was in my heart that 
Uh, our original plan just didn't give us time to cover, and I said, i got to get to it, and, and so it may, it may poke you a little bit. That's not my purpose. Please understand, I know that there's a lot of pain represented by uh, the people that are in this room. Maybe you didn't grow up in a healthy home, and this may bring some of that back, but I want to give you the hope and the purpose for living in a better environment today maybe than what you grew up in. You can provide that for your family now. It's not too late. Amen? We learn from our mistakes. My daddy, I, I got to say this, my dad, before he passed away in 2009, 2009 uh, he gathered us around his hospital bed. He said, look, I made a lot of mistakes. He loves his grandchildren. Up until the day he died, he is all about... And Marissa will tell you she was the favorite. <laughs> she might have been, okay? But anyway... Um, he loved his grandchildren, and he would always coach us on how to raise our children. And, and this is what he would say, because my daddy beat my butt with a belt. I needed that. I was hell on wheels, and he had to. If he hadn't, I might be in a federal pen somewhere right now. There are stories that I cannot share and never will share with you from this pulpit. But my daddy gathered us around, and he said, look. He said, I made a lot of mistakes raising y'all. A lot of mistakes. And he would list the things that he felt like he did wrong. And I didn't disagree. I felt like there were some things that could have done, he could have done better, you know. I'm like, I, I, in my mind, I'm going, Daddy, we love you. It don't matter how bad you were in that season of life. We still loved you. But he said, don't make the same mistakes that I made. Do better. Stay in the Word. Stay spiritually grounded. Make sure that you raise your family better than what I raised you. I want better for my grandchildren than even what I had for you. And I hope everybody in the room feels that way. Even if you, you were raised in a dysfunctional environment, you can provide better. Y'all okay as we move forward? Just a little foundation there, and I hope that you'll accept that. But let me preface all that I'm about to say with this as well. I want to be right up front with you. Be careful, be very careful about buying into the redefined family that our culture is wanting you to embrace and just accept. Um, the Bible is, is clear. on God had a lot to say about the family. He put the family here before he established his church. It was that important. He started with the family. He didn't start with the church. The family unit was, was defined clearly by God and what that's supposed to look like. And our culture is pushing further and further away from that. But you need to understand, this is a Bible-believing church. We are a Bible-believing church. We believe the Bible has a lot to say about family. And whether I don't give a royal rip what culture has to say about it. If it contradicts what the Bible says, I'm standing with a Bible. Okay? Just, I just, that's my little hellfire and brimstone thing. Now it's going to get better. First thing I'll tell you about the kind of family, the house plan that you need to put together to build a healthy front porch family is this. A healthy family displays an irrational love for one another. Life-giving love is given and received in a healthy family. And this love is spread lavishly to each member of the family regardless of the age or the sex or the competencies or the attractiveness or any of that stuff. And there's kind of an irrationality about it. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, the same kind of irrationality that made the Apostle John look toward the heavens and he cried out, Behold, what manner of love is this? Overwhelmed by this love. That love that, you know, the love of God would be poured into lives like mine and those in the family of God. John was literally stunned by the massive dose of love and the kindness that he had received from God. And it melted his heart and it motivated him to uh, reciprocate and to love God even more. Likewise, healthy families manifest stunning, irrational amounts of love toward one another. And that makes them healthy, what I'm calling today front porch families. Now, I'm talking about the kind of love. Let me give you an example. I'm talking about the kind of love that makes a 20-year-old college co-ed think back to her family at home while she's in this college environment, and she's reflecting on what she grew up in at home, and she's going, I can't believe the incredible acts of kindness that I was raised up in in my family. The loving words, the loving embraces, loving conversations around the dinner table, the love that laced the warnings and boundaries that my parents gave to me, the loving support of piano lessons, little league games, soccer games, cheerleading competition, dance recitals, and all those proms. The loving acts bestowed upon me through laundry and food and sleepovers and birthday parties because, you see, they don't appreciate that until they've gotten into about two years of college and they're having to provide all that stuff for themselves. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, my God, my mom and my daddy was good to me, right? 
And, and, and as the list gets longer in, in, in this young lady's mind, her heart gets warmer and her, her self-worth gets higher and her thankfulness to God for coming from that kind of a family intensifies into an overwhelming nature. Are y'all tracking? Yeah. Absolutely. Or the kind of love that makes a 28-year-old man who's holding his very firstborn child in his arms. He looks at that baby and he, he begin, it begins to well up in his heart and he says, I'm going to do everything in my power to flood your life with the kind of love that came my way in the home that I grew up in. Not a performance or achievement-based kind of love that exhausts those who try to earn it, but a healthy kind of love. So this young father says to the child that he's cradling in his arms. I'm going to fill your life with a supportive and committed, a committed Christ-honoring love that's going to convince you to the core of your being that you are treasured and you are favored and you're appreciated and you're celebrated for who God created you to be in our home. Come on now, that's good preaching right there. Listen, that's the irrational kind of love that Scripture defines as normal. Isn't it sad and tragic that it's often viewed today as abnormal behavior. So I, I want to ask you a question. Did you receive that kind of love growing up? I, look, I, I know there's a lot of people that can't answer in the affirmative to the questions I'm going to pose during the sermon. Again, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. And I want to steer you past your past today and help you look more to the future. But if you can't say you had that kind of irrational, unconditional love in the family you grew up in... Uh, let it motivate and compel you. Let it motivate and compel you to provide it for the family that you're in right now. That's what my daddy was saying. Son, I made some mistakes. Don't repeat my mistakes. Learn from them. I'm sorry for how I raised y'all during that season of life. You know, here's some things I would do different. You need to evaluate, and it ought to make you that much more committed to not raise your family in the pain and the heartbreak and the loss that you were raised in. Are y'all okay out there? It ought, it, ought to, it ought to help you to not default to what's common and to step up to what is uncommon and, and make a difference in, in that family and in that life. Listen, that's the irrational kind of love that scriptures define as normal. So don't make the same mistakes that were made uh, in the home you grew up in. Break that cycle and let faith set the guidelines for how you live together in your home right now. Now, you may not can do anything about the family that you grew up in again, but you can fix the one you're in right now. Okay? And it's painful to linger on, on some things that ha- may have happened in your past. Don't hang out there today. I want you to start making up your mind. I'm going to do better. I'm, I, I, I committed years ago. My kids, I, I believe they'll tell you, uh, knowing how I was raised, they will tell you my daddy didn't raise us like that, that he was raised in that difficult season of his life. We were determined that we weren't going to do that. And my father coached me on to say, don't repeat my mistakes, son. Do better than I did. And I hope that that's the attitude you'll walk out of here with. The second thing I'll tell you about building an incredible front porch onto your existing home, a healthy family communicates to each other with truth and grace. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. When you do all the research, you find that open communication, listen to me now, this is important, is consistently, number one or number two, in a, it, it, the number two sign in a healthy family. And the relationship within the home uh, that sets the tone for communication, success, or failure is the relationship between mama and daddy. Okay? Why is that? You see, if mom and dad can talk openly and vulnerably with each other and can listen lovingly to one another and can say difficult things to each other in gracious ways, then listen, this is a fact. There's a likelihood that these values are going to be operative in the rest of the family. It's going to be passed on to those children as well. And that bodes well for a healthy family. You have no idea what harsh tones and rage and rhetoric and demeaning and all of this. You have no idea the damage that it it does to children that are growing up in that environment. I was a regional youth coordinator, believe it or not, for a denomination in southwest Florida. When I was 16 years old, I didn't know nothing. Apparently, they didn't have nobody else. I don't know. But uh, I'd just been preaching about a year uh, since I was about 15, and I wasn't very good at it, but I had a lot of energy, and they liked energy in that denomination. So we had all kinds of meetings and youth rallies, and I was working with hundreds of kids. 
And I would preach at those regional rallies and give altar calls, and these kids would come up crying, and students, you know, and they would have these issues, these life-altering issues, and they'd be like, uh, Tracy, what do I do about this? And they'd lay out their scenario. And at 16, I'll be honest with you, I had a lot more enthusiasm than I had answers. I didn't have any answers. So inevitably, I would default and say, look, this is something you need to talk to your parents about. You, you really need to have a conversation with your parents because the one thing that I can tell you that was at the top of the list that my daddy did right, he always communicated well with us. He talked to us, and he, he spent time, time with us as a family, and he made it matter. And so I defaulted to that. I said, hey, talk to your parents. You know, they'll, they'll listen to you. You just need to go talk to them. And, and I always got something like this. Well, I've tried that, but my dad travels or my mom works, and they seem to never have time to just sit down and have a conversation. Or I tried, but... When I talk to mom about this stuff, it really makes her mad. She don't want to hear it. I try, but they won't listen. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm grounded and all that goes with that. My experiences working with students helped me formulate my plan for keeping communication open someday with my two kids. Uh, I never wanted Micah and Rissy to tell somebody, I can't talk to my daddy about it. I just can't talk to my, my mom about it. So we started, Sylvia and I, we started when they were really young, coaching them. and let, I mean, we, we pushed this into them. We let them know no conversation is off limits in our house. We, we, just, we you know, just pummeled their minds with that. There's nothing that's off limits. You can come to us without retribution. You can talk to us about anything. You can come to us and, and we'll talk about it. Listen, it worked. They told us everything. They, they literally told us everything. Puberty was a very dramatic time in our house. Uh, I would say to Marissa, she'd come in, you know, very emotional child, and, and um, she was just torn up for something that happened, you know, some middle school thing or whatever it was back then. And I would look at her with them big old tears, and you could raise your voice to that child, just like Lennox. And, and uh, hey, Lynn, it's good to have you in church today. You come to listen to Papa preach, huh? I love you, boy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but Marissa, she would ball her eyes out. And so I would, you know, my daddy's little girl, I'd say, what's the matter? Tell me about it. She'd start talking, and next thing you know, uh, man, she's really telling me all the details. Me and Sylvia are sitting there listening, and we're going, oh, my God. And then it got, in high school, it even it went up a notch, you know, and there was a lot more to, to tell. And uh, her and Micah both, and, oh, I can't even add Micah's stories to this. Uh, you wouldn't want me as a pastor anymore, or him, anywhere near this church, (laughs) if I told you about the Micah stories and the things that he brought to us. Uh, But Marissa and Micah would walk away from those uh, family conversations, uh, and Sylvia and I would look at each other, and in silence for a few minutes, and finally somebody would break the silence, and tears just welling up in our eyes, and I would say to Sylvia, I don't want to know this anymore. I don't, I don't want them to come to me with this stuff. Those days felt like that plane ride. Dear God, please don't let this plane crash. We don't want to die today. How are we going to help our kids through this stuff? But healthy families find a way to facilitate open communication, and they work really, really hard at it. You've got to be intentional. Are you all okay out there? They create windows of opportunity where family members can talk and listen to each other uh, without fear of repercussion or kickback. Now, we told Mike and Rissy, if you will just talk to us and tell the truth, we're going to work it out together. Micah found a way to beat the system. He always told the truth, but he often left parts of the truth out, (laughs) conveniently. So we realized he was doing that, you know, we realized he was doing that, so we had to amend the rule and say, tell the whole truth for Micah's benefit. And we would say, we're here to help you, not here to hurt you. And we had to work hard to create that kind of an environment in our home to be a healthy front porch family. You've got to be open and safe and trusting. You've got to create those kind of communication patterns in your home. And again, let me ask you a few questions. Did your family of origin communicate with truth and grace? Do Do the members of your current family feel like they can talk to you and to each other about anything? And look, I get it. I'm telling you, I so get it. You can't do anything about the family that you were raised in. If it was dysfunctional, it just is what it is. You can't go back and fix that. But you can have influence and impact on the family you're in right now. And you need to take the attitude that my daddy did. I was raised in a dysfunctional environment, but 
by Job, I will not raise my family in a dysfunctional environment. I'm going to do for them what was not done for me. That ought to be your attitude. Now, it's going to get tough. And look, again, let me, let me preface this. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. And this is going to be a painful section for some of you because you've lived through this nightmare. And I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to believe God's going to help you uh, to walk through this season and to come out of it stronger on the other side. But let me, let me give you number three. A healthy family vows to never abuse, shame, control, or intimidate each other. A healthy family realizes that certain kinds of violation do so much damage to a family member that they must be categorically and uncompromisingly outlawed within that home. And I predict that it's going to get real quiet in this auditorium in the next few moments, and I understand that, and I'm cool with it, because I'm going to, I'm going to tiptoe into an area that's very, very painful for a whole lot of people in the room. Some of you may have, told, have to hold your breath until I get through this part, and I understand, but keep in mind, again, I just want to say it, I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to help you, and help you provide better than what you were given. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about abuse in the family. You know, in, in, the, in the opinion of many, the most deeply wounded people walking around on our planet today are not those who have been mugged or, you know, on a subway or beaten up in an alley or cheated on uh, by an unfaithful spouse or even witnessed, uh, you know, firsthand horrors of war. And we have a lot of people that have lived through those kinds of things. As hurtful and disturbing as those experiences are, Experts tell us nothing compares to the soul damage done to children who are looking to their parents for love, for nurturing and affirmation, and receive instead some form of abuse from them. That shatters something inside people so deeply that sometimes they never recover in this life if they don't find the right source, resources for help. You see, when a child is yearning for emotional support from mom and dad, when they're yearning for emotional support from mom and dad, instead they receive emotional abuse. When a child is, is yearning for tender words from their parents and instead they get yelled at and, and stands on the receiving end of a parent's rage. When a child is yearning for a nurturing hug or touch and instead gets a slap across the face or a fist to the jaw or a kick in the ribs. And, and need I say it, God, I hate to say it, but when a child is just beginning to discover the mysteries of his or her own sexuality, and there's that tender mix of scare and wonder and excitement going on, and suddenly, in the middle of the night, a parent appears at the foot of the bed with an agenda that makes all of heaven shriek in horror. Friends, when it comes to shattering the soul of a child, abusive parents top the list. There's nothing any worse. And healthy families recoil at the very thought of what I'm describing now because that's abnormal, but it's a lot of children's normal today. And they vow never to be abusive to their own family in, in any way. Along with outlawing abuse of any kind, healthy front porch families know the damage that shaming can do, that controlling can do, that intimidating behaviors can bring in the life of a child. So they make a pact, and, and with the spouse, they make a pact and they keep it. We're not going to allow abuse, shame, control, or intimidation of anybody in this home. Symbolically, we're just saying we're, we're going to get rid of the computer room and we're going to build a front porch. We're going to come together and we're going to fix this. We're not going to live this way anymore. You can do that starting today. You can fix that. And if you need help, we've got help for you. Give us a call. Let us get you started in the right direction. But don't put up with this in, in your home environment anymore. You can have a lot of positive things going on in your family, but if you fall down on number three, it collapses the integrity of the whole house, not just the front porch. The, the last one, and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do to help your family this summer, a big change coming at Cross Point that I need to announce at the end of this uh, point number four. A healthy family shares a common spiritual foundation. In the culture we live in today, perhaps more than any other time in history, families need more than a little dab of God. Y'all okay out there? Uh, they need to be immersed. Their lives need to be immersed in God. With all the forces in society that are undermining the family now more than ever, families need a common source of truth, love, strength, forgiveness, and grace. 
Look, they need God in their home. They need God in their lives. They, they need Christ at the center of the family unit. Listen, I've seen families disintegrate, and I've seen families implode after putting G, pushing Jesus to the back burner or packing him away in a box and pushing him on a shelf somewhere. They push away from God. We, you know, we just don't have time for that right now. We'll reconnect after our calendar gets cleared up. we got all this stuff that's flooding our calendar, and we need, you know, our kids got all this, this big agenda in life, and we're going to push and push and push, and we just don't have time to stay connected to faith right now. And I promise you, you think you've got all the time in the world to reinstall God anywhere along the way into your family life, but the Bible says, what is your life? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. And I, I'm telling you, it, it seemed like just yesterday that I was young and pretty. <laughs> and Sylvia goes, yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> and healthy. Sometimes if you just close your eyes, you can still see. You can still, <laughs> you can still see. Don't open your eyes. It's scary. <laughs> but healthy, and then suddenly it's like somebody flipped a switch, right? Or they snapped their fingers, and, and now it's, it's old age is just getting here. And, and you know, uh, haggard and tired and wrinkled, and, and what's not turning gray is turning loose. It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty to watch. <laughs> Seriously, if we had stalled or waited or thought to ourselves... We can reconnect with God anytime, but right now we've got a lot of stuff we want to do, a big life we want to live away from, you know, Christian community or God. If Sylvia and I would have thought that, we would have missed our chance because life is like a mist. It's here one day, and boom, it's gone. Please don't wait to put God at the center of your front porch family. I, 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 I used this illustration, and I thought it was worth repeating. Uh, I've done some pretty major fasts in, in my lifetime, and I don't say that for, except to make a point about fasting. The longest I've ever fasted, I was, I was thinking it was three days uh, total fast, but it was actually a seven-day fast that we did uh, out at uh, Lumber Bridge. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, seven-day total fast. We do a 21-day Daniel fast, you know, fruits and vegetables kind of thing. Uh, not, it's, it's a great fast, but not nearly as painful as a total fast. And seven-day fast, uh, the first three days, you will kill somebody that brings food into your presence. <laughs> there is nothing spiritual about the first days. You're going to beat somebody down. You know, it's like, keep that, sm I don't even want to smell your hamburger. I'll slap you silly and take it away from you, okay? <laughs> you, that's all you think about is food. Three days, you're focused on food. Everywhere you look, you, you turn off all the media, but somehow still... Food creeps back into your life. You smell it. You walk outside. You drive past something. Somebody's grilling. All those folks are going to hell when you're on a seven-day fast. <laughs> you know, really. And so anyway, but you know something crazy happened? Three days of pain, intense pain, just craving for food that I couldn't get my mind off of. I wanted food. On the fourth day, I started noticing something unique. I woke up, and the first thought I had was not for food. Lunchtime, I didn't even think about lunch. The fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh day, I was done with food. I, and I, I and even told my wife, I said, I don't think I'll ever have a craving for food like I did before again because I just had no desire to eat. It happens on about the fourth day that you just, you just lose your drive to eat. And it doesn't hurt anymore like it did. You're just drinking water or doing whatever you do. And all of a sudden you realize this isn't nearly as painful as it was. And on the seventh day you're going, wow, I could just keep going. And a lot of people do. My plan was to start eating again on the eighth day. I got up on the eighth day and I didn't have a desire for anything. I didn't have a taste for anything. I literally knew that if I didn't find something that I could eat without literally making me sick and slowly uh, work my way back in, if I didn't do something that I could literally live a long time before I eventually you know, realized you're not eating, you're going to die. You, you've got to put something in your body and you, you're going to die if you don't start eating again, right? Let me tell you this, and you can take this any way you want, but I believe what I'm telling you is absolutely true. I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to help you, but I believe this is true. I believe the same principle applies 
with your relationship with God when you pause that relationship and you put him on the shelf. All of a sudden, you wake up and you realize after a season of no interaction with God, no Christian community, no, no spiritual growth, you just checked out of everything that you were so passionate about. All of a sudden, you wake up one day and you realize, you know, I'm not as hungry for that spiritual thing that I used to, as I used to be. It doesn't mean as much to me. It's easier for you to miss continuously and never go back on a Sunday or never get back to a small group or never open your Bible or never get down on your uh, knees beside your bed and pray. All of a sudden, you don't miss it anymore. You used to crave it. You you thought you couldn't live without it, but because you convinced yourself it's all right to check out for a season, all of a sudden, that season became a lifestyle, and now it doesn't mean anything to you. You go, preacher, that's an extreme. I see it happen all the time. All the time. And the next thing you know, your life, your spirit, your body, your, the spirit, man or woman, boy or girl that God created you to be is dying because you're not feeding it anymore. And you don't even realize that you're doing that damage to your spirit. I'm just saying, teach your children about God, but don't just teach them. You need to show them God. Let them see God in your home, in your relationships, in your lives, in your commitments. They need to see God through you. Y'all okay out there? One last time, a few questions on this point. Was Christ at the center of your home, the home you grew up in? Do you have that shared common foundation now in your family? Again, you can't change the family you grew up in, but you can do something about the one you're in right now. Romans 12, 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Now, I don't have a smooth transition. I usually work out a smooth transition. I don't have one. So let me just jump into what I need to say before I'm done. Now, y'all are getting out a lot earlier than the first service did. Before we close, I I need to share some exciting and important news with you. So I want you to, to lean in and catch up with me. My staff and I have been talking for a while now and working through... Um, what I'm going to share with you, and we feel this is the best way that we can build your faith and strengthen your family as we go into the summer. I think school was out on Friday, right? So the timing is perfect for us to initiate some changes uh, here at Cross Point. Most of you know, uh, last, week, last year we completed our new Kids Point Ministry Center and the expansion and update in this auditorium. Uh, we've gone from a 375-seat auditorium to a 600-seat auditorium. Today it's about a 500-seat auditorium. But we plan on tightening it up a little bit uh, with COVID and all these vaccinations and start bringing in a few more chairs each week. And uh, uh, we're pretty excited to be able to, to, you know, to accommodate about 600 people in each service. At one time, uh, we were even having three Sunday morning services before we expanded our facility uh, because a smaller auditorium just couldn't accommodate everybody. But times, they are a-changing, Right? Uh, We have a larger facility, and as a result of COVID, we have a smaller on-site church than we've had in many, many years. And the good news is we're growing again. We've got a lot of new faces in our church, uh, and our VIP parking has usually got a lot of cars in it. Um, And we're having a phenomenal comeback here. At Crosspoint, we're always evaluating the process. Uh, We didn't used to do this, but we've learned we have to do this. You can't get stuck in something that's no longer working, right? Right? So you've got to continuously evaluate the process. We date Here we date the process, but we're married to the mission. Our mission never changes. Amen? We may date a few processes, but our mission is going to be consistently the same. So here's our plan this summer, and I'm going to explain to you how that this plan is going to help, help families uh, build faith and strengthen your family. Beginning next Sunday, y'all need to pay attention or you're going to be lost. Beginning next Sunday, we will only have one service at Cross Point Church through the summer until August the 29th when we relaunch and we do two services, okay? Bigger auditorium, a lot more chairs, and uh, less people coming during the summer usually than what we have during the course of the year. But we thought, how can we take advantage of that and make it great for families to grow in faith and to strengthen the family unit during a time Uh, when traditionally they just feel nothing but guilt for not being at church. So we want to talk to you about that and try to help you. We're going to have one service that's going to start at 10 a.m., one kids point service and one adult service. Now let me tell you how this is going to work. Volunteers, let me speak to you first. You guys got us through a a year that we actually thought we might not survive. There was a season there that, uh, golly, I'm like, we're, we're not going to keep our doors open. It just got really bad. You have no idea how close we came to closing down 
uh, because of the overhead that we have here that we've been working hard to reduce. Our ministry strategy for our volunteers has always been worship in one service and serve in another, right? Uh, You guys have heard that. We don't want you to just come and serve and then not be a part of worship. You'll burn out. We want you to come in here and worship and get the word and, and leave energized. This summer, we're asking you to volunteer for at least two Sundays every month and rest. Take a break for the other two Sundays. Now, let me tell you what that could look like for you. If you're in town and, and it's not your, your week to serve, come on to church. We're going to be here, right? Come on to church on your non-serving days. Meet us here for corporate worship. We think you need to spend some time with your family this summer, though. Not just at church, but building each other up and setting in motion some of the principles that we've talked about today. Some of you need to go home and work on that front porch, okay? Take, take two or three weekends off this summer. Go ahead and plan it. You go, PT, I ain't got time, I ain't got the money, all that goes with that. Let me tell you something, figure it out, okay? You will figure it out, you will find a way when the newest, latest, greatest model of some stupid thing comes out, you will find a way to acquire that. You always do. Everybody wants the new stuff, right? And they'll do whatever, what, from, you know, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Your heart will follow your treasure. If you want something, you'll find a way to make it happen. If you, if you value your family, you're going to find a way to build a front porch into the environment of your home. Y'all okay out there? So take, take two or three weekends and plan to get away this summer. And, and for those of you that say, I can't, you can drive over to the beach. You can drive over to the beach. You can go to the mountains. You can ride down the south of the border. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just do it together. Do it together. Plan those trips on the Sundays that you aren't serving and volunteering and stick to your commitment to serve and volunteer. Now, again, on August the 29th, we're going to reboot two services. On the Sundays that you aren't here, here's here's how we're going to help you. We always live stream, and you should watch the service together as a family. Whether you're sitting on the beach or whether you're in the mountains, get your smartphone out, get your computer out, log in to YouTube, whatever you got to do, and watch Crosspoint Church together even while you're vacating Crosspoint on vacation, right? So, So watch it and build that spiritual community together with your family. We're going to live stream every Sunday at 10 a.m. So watch together even when you're away and and build yourselves up spiritually. You may not know this right now, but you need Crosspoint Church. I often tell people when they come to me and say, hey, we're going to be out of town uh, and just want to let you know we're not going to be here next Sunday and we're we're not going to be able to watch or whatever. I say, hey, find you a church and visit that church on your vacation. You know why I do that? Because 99 times out of 100, they come back and go, oh, my God, I love my church. I love my church. Every once in a while, somebody will come back and say, hey, I went to this great church, and they do this. We should really do that here. And it works really well. And if you, if you go to another church, you know, and you, you find something you just love better than here, we'll bless you and release you to go there and be a part of that if that's what God's calling you to do. But it rarely ever happens. All of a sudden, people realize, I got things pretty good where I worship, right? Our church is doing some great things, and things are happening, and people miss that. They miss it so much, they drive all the way from Winter Park, Florida to be here on Sunday. They're sitting right there, right there. (laughs) I'm sorry, I had to. I just had to. He says he came into town to see his grandparents. I really think he came to see me. That's all I'm saying about that. So, so we want you to know that we're going to do that, and you need this in your life. On the Sundays that you're, you're, you're here serving, the, listen to the details, it's important. On the Sundays that you're here serving and you miss the worship and the message, guess what? We're going to rebroadcast the live 10 a.m. service. We're going to rebroadcast it at 5 p.m. every Sunday afternoon, okay? So you can go and sit down with your family and watch and worship together on Sunday still. Just plan it. If you're volunteering at Kids Point or Fit Team or whatever, you can still worship together with the rebroadcast of your church family on Sunday afternoon. You don't have to miss a thing, right? We're going to always be intentional about faith and family here. I've even asked our team leaders 
to go ahead and put out their planning center calendars for the entire summer so you can mark off or block off the days that you, you're going to plan a vacation or a getaway. Are you going to the beach or the mountains? Hey, go do that. You guys didn't get to do it last summer. Go do that. Spend that time with your family. But it's easy to tune in and stay connected to spirituality and faith and sermons and worship and all that stuff. And our live stream is better than it's ever been. It's really good. So, you know, it's not the same as being here, but it's, it's almost because you, the only thing you can't do is serve and fulfill your calling by watching live stream, but you can come back and do that here. So for the summer, you can sign up and you can volunteer at least two Sundays a month. Now, for this to work, here's what's got to happen. Uh, we're still going to need more people to step up for Kids Point and the Fit Team this summer um, and other environments where we just need help. We, we can't do it with just the small group of volunteers that we've been surviving with during the COVID quarantines and all that's been going on. So here's what we're asking. Give us six Sundays. Six Sundays this summer. Give us six of your Sundays to serve. Everybody here. Everybody here can serve somewhere. You can hold a door and you can smile and you can say, Welcome to Cross Point. We're glad you're here. Even if you're an introvert, you can do that. Right? Right? You don't even have to make eye contact. You just got to act like you're happy to see them. Welcome to Cross Point. We're glad you're here. <laughs> They'll be like, well, what's going on? That's okay. We'll take that. It's better than nothing, right? We'll take that, and it's important to us. It's been a tough year, so we need your help. Step up and volunteer. Get involved, connected. Kids Point, uh, squad student ministry, uh, security. Uh, everybody defaults to security. Bill don't, he, he, he's not going to just take anybody, okay? Uh, so, so we need more in Kids Point and squad and fit team than just about anywhere else. But, but we do need some security guys, especially during those lean summer months. So, and girls. Some of the girls, are they pay better attention than the guys sometimes. I'm just saying. I shouldn't have said that. I just ruined a great sermon. But it's true. It's true. <laughs> but you can grow your faith. You can strengthen your family and at the same time grow your faith. You can do both. We're here to help. So here, let me give you a summary, and then we're done. If you're in town, come worship with us on site. If you're not, watch together as a family at 10 a.m. every Sunday. If you're serving in Kids Pointer Fit Team or security or coffee shop, miss the worship and the message, then be intentional to sit down with your family at 5 p.m. and watch the rebroadcast. We intend to make it worth your while. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay? So let me pray for you, and then we're going to believe God to send us out of here. And look, what time are we meeting next Sunday? 10 o'clock, don't forget that. You're going to see people you haven't seen in several years. Because, you know, 9 and 11 is coming together. Okay? So we're going to tighten things up a little bit, but we're all coming together. And there will be 350, 400 people in the room with 550 seats. So you still have some elbow room. But we're going to come together, and we're going to worship God together. And you're going to enjoy it. We're going to make it phenomenal, and you're going to enjoy it. And some great things are going to happen. But we also need you to serve. We need you to step up and volunteer. Let me pray for you. Father God, I love you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Lord, this series has been very challenging, but so informative, and I believe very helpful based on the feedback we've already received. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll touch the hearts of the people that are in this room. And God, would you help us to build some front porches into our family dynamic. Lord, we need to get more intentional about the time that we spend together building spiritual foundations in our home. Lord, building open communication, sharing unconditional love. Help us, God, Father, to take it serious and be intentional. Lord, not to default to what we're used to and what we had growing up. It's so easy to be the same with our family that our original, original family was with us. Help us, God, not to just default to something that's dysfunctional, but help us to be better than that. Help us to be better than that in Jesus' name. Help us, God. Strengthen this, this church, these families. God, you put the family here long before you put the church here. So help us to be intentional about making it the strength of our communities and of the body of Christ. We give you the praise and honor and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me all over the room?